All right. Thanks, everyone, uh, for joining us. We, uh, as always, sincerely appreciate the Seattle Science Foundation for putting this tremendous conference on. And uh, I think hopefully we have some interesting stuff for everyone tonight. Uh, I have the good fortune of um, sharing uh, this conference with Dr. Arlay, who obviously is certainly world renowned in the deformity field from an orthopedic surgery standpoint. And we're also joined and, and he will serve as moderator as Dr. Ali Oster. Um, he heads up the deformity uh, standpoint from a spine surgery uh, department within the neurosurgical field at Penn. And then we have three of our great fellows as well. Um, we have Saurabh Sinha, who's one of the neurosurgery fellows here at Penn. And we're very fortunate to have the opportunity to work with him as long as uh, two of our orthopedic fellows, which are Jun Lee and Colin Whitaker, and I can't say enough glowing things about each one of them. Um, so with that, we'll get the ball rolling with Dr. Arlay. He's got a brief talk on um, revision deformity surgery. And uh, as always, we'll certainly keep our eye on the chat box for any questions that come up or arise. So thanks everyone. Uh, thank you. So uh, good evening, everybody. So I will try to get, here we go, so. So I, I think just the revision for uh, spine deformity for non-union, we should remember uh, this uh, sequence. That's, uh, this happens in Wales uh, a few years ago and uh, a driver, we don't know whether he was drunk or not, just uh, tipped over uh, in the port. You can see he's uh, standing on the top of his car. And uh, for that, they just call a wrecker, the red truck here. And uh, the, the red truck started to lift up the car and uh, was almost there. And just, uh, you can see it's leaning a little bit and you see what happens, Poof, catastrophic uh, situation, everything gets into the water. So what do they do at the time when they have this situation, the car is back and the wrecker uh, truck is uh, in the water. So what do they do? They call another medium sized uh, uh, truck and the medium sized trucks lift up the car without any problem. That works fine. It puts the car uh, in the back and uh, following this, uh, he wants to pull the bigger truck out of the water. That's probably uh, uh, too much uh, uh, for him. So uh, let's see what happens. And back the two trucks get into the water now. So then now they call another wrecker, a bigger one, but maybe not big enough to get uh, all this uh, mess out of the side of the water. And when you're dealing with this non-union uh, revision of a spine deformity, just think always about this. And should I do a little bit or just do a little bit? It usually doesn't work. Okay, you really have to get the big truck uh, to get the, the car out. Otherwise, you're gonna get from one catastrophe to another catastrophe. So what's the psoriasis in the spine? Is there a psoriasis when you see uh, a patient who has pain will come with uh, some issue. Uh, you, obviously, you have some obvious situation like on the left, left-hand side where you have broken rods and you have non-obvious situation where the patient has pain, did fine initially, and then afterwards uh, start to develop pain and is, you don't know what's going on in the spine. So how are you going to just prove that there's, there's a psoriasis? Sometimes quite difficult, but just remember that the 15 to 20 person, and that's a recent literature that shows this, 15 to 20% of adult deformity patients who had pre-surgery have an non-union. So there's a huge number. Um, and uh, how are they gonna present? They're gonna present with a pain, obviously implant breakage. They may have some mobility and flexion extension on the, on the X-ray, don't forget to uh, get the flexion extension because sometimes you're going to, uh, to uh, see uh, your broken rod, the flexion extension X-rays or some mobility at one place. And the same thing with the side banders. You may just uh, be able to see on the side banders some uh, uh, reduction and you have the psoriasis. Sometimes you do oblique views as well to uncoil the rods to, to see if they're broken or not. Obviously, a uh, halo around the screws will tip you that there's a psoriasis. The CT scan is quite helpful when it shows a psoriasis, but sometimes it overcalls the fusion because uh, always think the CT scan is a thick slice is three millimeters and it's average everything out. So it looks like you have a beautiful fusion. You go back and explore and there was obviously a psoriasis. So uh, uh, a CT scan that shows a, a solid fusion doesn't necessarily mean there's a, a, 
a solid fusion. You may have absolute forces, and then you have obviously the gold standard today with still the exploration of the fusion mass. Obviously, you have to understand why there was absolute forces in the first place. Is it uh, because of the patient? Uh, uh, he was a smoker, he has diabetes, he was overweight, uh, or is it the surgeon who didn't do a good job achieving the fusion? It's in my case, I have, sometimes I haven't done a very good job, and, and then I pay it later when I see my patient coming back. Uh, patient was left with a poor balance, the fusion was not good enough, there was no anterior column support, the instrumentation was inadequate, uh, using uh, uh, two small rods or um, or uh, not enough instrumentation. So this is a patient of mine that did uh, uh, many years ago, 20, 25 years ago, you see uh, uh, mixed construct. She did very well after instrumentation for idiopathic scoliosis. And then three years down uh, the road, she hears a pop in her back and she had this large uh, pedicle screws and a hook at the bottom and she had obviously psoarthrosis. Uh, at the time, uh, my colleagues advised me to extend the instrumentation. I thought it was a little bit severe to go down uh, for one level, but we could uh, get a good purchase in uh, the, the screws distally. And uh, she did very well with this uh, uh, simple uh, replacement of rods and regraft and compression across the fusion. And that's a, a quite a simple situation when you have this type of psoarthrosis. Um, another simple situation, another patient who comes when she's a young adult, she had a previous uh, idiopathic surgery done a few years uh, before. She had some hooks uh, uh, inserted. She already had clipping on the rods for pain. She's upset because of the pain. She's upset because the back doesn't look good. And this is a patient uh, you can simply uh, revise, re-instrument, do some smith beat osteotomies, and uh, you'll get a, a beautiful correction. And that was uh, achieved uh, with a uh, uh, revision, removal of the hooks for screws, uh, some Smith bead osteotomy, and just uh, through the psoarthrosis to rebalance the patient. And, and she did very well uh, with this type of uh, revision instrumentation. So that's quite uh, still simple. Again, a simple situation a bodybuilder who had successful surgery five years before. He does very well um, initially, but then he works at the gym all the time. And um, just uh, can you go back? Um, he works at the gym all the time and uh, uh, he hears a pop and he breaks his rod and develops a pain. So you look carefully, these are 5'5 uh, five, five titanium rods, probably not enough for a bodybuilder this, uh, um, this strong. So uh, we revise him, uh, change the rods, put bigger rods uh, and uh, a third rod, BMP, recompression across the psoarthrosis. And he did very well. He could back, go back to uh, bodybuilding afterwards. Uh, so that was not enough instrumentation for uh, strong patients. Another patient, two still simple issues. Um, uh, successful surgery uh, uh, a few years before, and then she developed uh, pain, new onset pain. And the um, CT scan uh, shows uh, what looks like to be arthrosis, uh, where there's some radiolution C around the distal screws. And she come to see us because everybody wanted to extend the fusion one more level. And I was looking at the MRI. I couldn't see what the level 3-4 had done to me. I didn't have any grudge against this level 3-4. It looks pretty nice. So why do we have to extend the fusion when she had a beautiful result? We have to stay at the same location. So uh, for this patient, there was a simple solution to do it was to uh, do an, uh, an olive uh, to uh, get the fusion anteriorly and, and then revise the posterior instrumentation without having to extend one level. And this is very often you can do this. You don't always need to extend when you have a psoarthrosis, either by going on the side, on the front, uh, change the rod, bigger rods, a bigger screws, uh, the extension of the fusion proximity or distally when in face of psoarthrosis is not the rule. Far from it, if the levels are perfectly pristine, there's often no reason to extend uh, to another level. So these are a relatively simple situations. Now you have some situations which are a little bit more complex. Uh, the alignment and the balance start to uh, get lost. Uh, this is a patient who had multiple previous surgery. The last one is a rod removal, and she's developed more pain. Uh, pain, uh, And then there's some uh, beginning of uh, uh, coronal decompensation, as well as uh, 
uh, progressive kyphosis. Uh, and the CT scan uh, shows uh, what appears to be uh, some arthrosis uh, at different level of the spine. Uh, the CT scan, however, showed that she had arctic uh, uh, ectasia, uh, when she, uh, so she has a large uh, aorta with definitely uh, this looks to, looks to be a little bit threatening for the pedicle screw. So uh, this uh, patient, we uh, went back in and did a multiple Smith bead osteotomy, and we didn't instrument all the spine. You know, you don't need to, for many cases to put screws at every single level of the spine. If you plan your your, your surgery adequately, uh, and that's what we did. You see, we put lots of screws on the convex side, but not that many on the concave side because we had concern of this aortic ectasia of the patient. And uh, she did uh, very well afterwards, and she could uh, go back as a hairdresser. Now you have more complex situations where everything is lost. The alignment is lost. You have spinal stenosis. You have neurologic compromise. The deformity is fixed. The patient is frail. She has osteoporosis. Patient had multiple previous surgery, laminectomy. It's only a scar ball. Patient had previous infection. So uh, it's a mess in front of you and you don't know how to tackle the uh, situation. So. In these complex cases, first thing is, is, can you do something simple of this complex case? That's the first thing to think of. You know, I'll say, uh, instead you see complex cases and everybody say, I'm gonna do two levels of VCR of these patients. and say, why do you want to? Want this? There might be a more simple solution than a two level VCR for the, this patient. So uh, can you go back, um, Linda, can you go back on this one? Or maybe I'll just go back, uh, there we go. So this is a patient who had um, multiple previous surgery and she has terrible low back pain. She has a mild flat back and the, um, uh, that doesn't work just, uh, excuse me, so I have to go back. Yeah, and the uh, a CT scan at the uh, bottom shows uh, obviously arthrosis in the sacrum at L5S1. And there is a, a cage you, um, uh, that uh, was inserted at L5S1 uh, through a TILIF. We don't have the, the picture, didn't show, but uh, there was a TILIF case at L5S1 where you have arthrosis. So instead of going back uh, at L5S1, remove the TILIF uh, from the back, uh, do a PSO at L4 to get the realignment, or PSO at L5, Let's go in the front. Let's remove uh, the, the uh, TILIF cage from the front and, and do a, a, a cage, but let's put a, a, a hyperlodotic cages to overpower the posterior instrumentation. And that's what we did. We, we uh, inserted the hyperlodotic cage, as you can see, overpower the posterior instrumentation, and then went back in the back. And I, I got all the correction uh, uh, from the back that we could achieve. And that's a patient, as you can see, um, uh, perfectly well balanced uh, in the AP and the lateral plane of the osphere. So this case that appeared to be relatively complex, requiring the uh, revision of the TILIF from the back, plus uh, pedicle subtraction astronomy at the level above, we can make it something very simple. It, it, uh, the, we did the, the whole surgery in uh, four or five hours and with minimal amount of blood loss. So obviously you have other cases, a little bit different, but the same principle. Flat back patients, kyphosis, uh, arthrosis, uh, and then you can see multiple arthrosis. Again, a TDF with arthrosis. but obviously uh, in these cases, we, we couldn't go in the front front, uh, but we could go lateral. So we did an olive in this patient, we created the lordosis at two level and, uh, and did a posture instrumentation. And what's the good in this case, when you have done the realignment from the front, you only need to do a, a minimal smith beat osteotomy, check the nerve in the back and your instrument. So the surgery is already done when you go in the back. You only have to put the screws in and the rods in. You don't have to do any complex things. So that's a situation that are uh, um, uh, relatively complex. You can make uh, simple. Uh, another patient with a pedicle subtraction osteotomy uh, who uh, broke her rod uh, several years after the pedicle subtraction osteotomy because she had only two rods. So how do you revise this? Uh, we're gonna fix the patient posteriorly and to make sure that she doesn't recur the, um, the breakage of the rod uh, once she is fixed posteriorly. We are going to uh, go anteriorly and put a cage and fix it anteriorly. So like this, she has four rods in the back and she has the cage in the front. 
So I, I think this is a, the, the big truck in this case. We just want to make sure nothing ever happens again. That's what the patient wanted. So I said, I don't want this to happen ever again. So you have to uh, really to instrument this patient and do a solid fusion. Now you have the last case scenario where the complex case remains complex. Then you don't have much a solution, uh, but to, um, to bite the bullet and just do a complex surgery. This is a 62 years old female. She had multiple previous surgery, as you can imagine, as a lot of rods, she had a previous laminectomy. She's a flat back, she's miserable. Uh, she can hardly walk well, except with a walker. Uh, she has a psoriasis, bending on the fusion mass, um, lack of uh, uh, continuity between the rods. Uh, and this patient, <coughs> we had no other options in this case, but to do a pedicle subtraction astronomy. Uh, uh, but you can see this patient because we don't want this to happen again. We put five rods, two satellite rods, and, um, and uh, three uh, longitudinal rods on the back. So she has five rods total and uh, the, uh, on the top to protect the pedicle subtraction astronomy of uh, further psoriasis in the back. Um, uh, same principle with this uh, patient, multiple previous uh, surgery, uh, flat back, kyphosis on the top, uh, spinal stenosis at this level in the thoracolumbar junction with uh, uh, some uh, malopathic sign and, and the, uh, this kyphosis, uh, psoriasis at the top uh, for which uh, uh, we did uh, uh, um, uh, vertebral column, three column astronomy with uh, the cage at this level to get realignment at the thoracolumbar junction. And again, uh, four rods to protect uh, the construct from uh, uh, breaking again. Uh, so we have a uh, good uh, fixation. Um, and this uh, nice case again with massive epidural scarring, just like this case where you have uh, to do, excuse me, this is this case, yeah. And uh, another case different when you have a very severe deformity, a patient is a smoker. Obviously, we don't operate on smoker. If they want to have a surgery, they have to stop uh, um, smoking. That's what uh, she did. And then we did revise her. So you think the deformity is mostly at the thoracolumbar junction. This is true. But even if we were to correct the thoracolumbar junction, she would still be flat back. She didn't have enough doses. So we, we thought that we would uh, get the correction uh, through the... Uh, um, uh, through the lumbar spine doing a PSO at L4, and then smith peterson asked me at thoracolumbar junction uh, to get the correction of uh, uh, the deformity, and obviously in this uh, patient, four rods, uh, to achieve a longer standing result with uh, two, two iliac screws on each side, uh, two uh, regular iliac screws and two S2 uh, iliac screw to, to make sure that the construct is going to be solid, and that's alignment. So this patient, you can see, uh, she has a total of six rods. She has uh, uh, two satellite rods for the pedicle subtraction astronomy, and she has uh, uh, four rods on the side to hold her up uh, to prevent her from uh, further uh, breakage. Um, so revision of thoracosis, I'm going to stop here too, so we can go into the, some case discussions. The principle when you do in spinal deformity of thoracosis is to do more. Just uh, think about the, the records and just falling in, in, into the water. You have to do more. Uh, you cannot just do the same thing that was done initially. That's not gonna work. You have to address all the problem. If there's a lack of fusion, you have to do more posterior or anterior fusion. You have to get more graft. If there's not enough instrumentation, if the instrumentation is too small, not big enough, insert more instrumentations uh, go for insert four yak screws if necessary, uh, four rods. Uh, if you have a not good balance, you have to do more astronomies, realign more uh, Smith Peter astronomy or, or vertebral column resection or doing the front to realign the patients. And obviously, if you have a no uh, comp energy compression, you have to uh, decompress more the patients. So I don't think in this world of revision of deformity, uh, the application. Uh, no, uh, less is more applies to any of these patients. It doesn't work. I mean, if you want, you can clip a rod sometimes, which is painful, that's, that's fine. But in this type of patients, uh, they already have a four, five or six uh, surgery. So when you're there to take care of them, you have uh, to offer the, the last surgery. It's often not even the last one, at least the work you've done, you're not gonna have to revise the work you've done. You have to do more in first place uh, go big or go home and always think about uh, the, the, 
this uh, small kind waste that tipped over and then they got the rescue uh, uh, records to uh, <laughs> to <laughs> dig her out of the water but it didn't work because they did they went every time they went a little bit too small thank you i cannot hear you okay uh dr Arley, thank you um We'll probably ask some questions with the cases that highlight, uh, you know, a lot of the points that you've made. Um, so if it's okay, why don't we go ahead and start with uh, the cases? I think uh, Dr. Sinha's going first. Yep, uh, everyone's able to see my screen here. Yep. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Saurabh Sinha, one of the uh, uh, PGY-6 neurosurgery residents and enfolded spine fellow um, at Penn. Um, I've had the good fortune uh, this past year of working uh, pretty closely with Drs. Arlay, Osterick, and Casper, uh, as well as Dr. Lee and Whitaker. Um, it's been a real priv privilege to uh, learn from them. Uh, at times, I feel like I'm standing on, a, on the top of a large, crooked iceberg, <clears throat> and there's uh, an endless amount to learn. So I'll, I'll show you a case that I did with um, Dr. Arlay and Dr. Osterk, um, and uh, it really highlights some of the points that Dr. Arlay was discussing. Um, so this was a 63-year-old uh, gentleman who's uh, had an extensive um, uh, history of spine surgeries, uh, both in his thoracolumbar lumbar region and cervical region. Um, of interest is, are, are his prior thoracolumbar lumbar surgeries, which include uh, a long segment a lower thoracic to, to <clears throat> pelvic fusion with uh, multiple inner bodies across the lumbar spine. Um, that surgery uh, was complicated by discitis and osteomyelitis that required removal of uh, his hardware minus the inner bodies. Um, that was about seven years prior to his pre presentation to us. Um, in the interim, after hardware removal, he developed uh, severe back pain and a pitch forward posture that you can see here, um, as well as complaints of severe bilateral or extremely radicular pain. And he's tried conservative measures, has exhausted uh, all of that. Um, on his physical exam, he's uh, severely forward leaning. Again, uh, you can see that uh, pretty obviously here, unable to stand erect, uh, fairly kyphotic at, uh, at just the thoracolumbar junction here. Uh, unsteady myelopathic gait. Again, remember he has uh, cervical uh, stenosis as well, um, requires uh, a walker, um, has sort of diffuse weakness, uh, most pronounced in the uppers, but, but um, uh, as well, you know, uh, about four out of five or so throughout the lower extremities, um, normal uh, reflexes in the bilateral lowers. Um, his imaging is as follows. I'll, I'll point out some, um, some important uh, considerations here. So he has an obvious uh, almost 30 degree uh, kyphotic angulation at T1112 is the level here. Um, and this is a, a fairly obvious uh, non-union along a very fused uh, segment from the lower thoracic uh, spine uh, down the lumbar spine. Um, the axial cuts show some uh, relevant um, uh, um, you know, uh, elements from his prior surgery, including uh, multiple inner bodies. Um, on the bottom here, and then a laminectomy uh, defect at the uh, at the level of, of his kyphotic, uh, the most severe kyphotic angulation. Um, his upright x-rays uh, shown here so show severely uh, positive sagittal balance, about 16 centimeters, um, a pretty uh, 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 significant lack of lumbar lordosis um, and a, a over 60 degree mismatch between his lumbar lordosis and uh, pelvic incidence. Um, and again, uh, you can see here that, that sort of segment of, of focal kyphotic angulation here. Um, the other important thing to point out from his preoperative imaging is, you know, as you can imagine, based on uh, his CAT scan, is, is that this is, this is a very rigid uh, deformity here. Uh, when you compare the scout uh, CT scan in which he's uh, laying supine to his upright x rays, there's really no change in, in the amount of, uh, of kyphosis that he has at that T1112 uh, level. So, you know, we know we're not going to get much just by getting him, you know, prone on the table. Um, and then his MRI scan um, shows again at, at that uh, segment of severe kyphosis, he's, he's also severely stenotic um, despite having prior lamies, he's very scarred down epidurally. Um, and uh, remember he, he does have uh, element of neurogenic claudication 
um, and gait instability as well. Sora, pause for a moment on that MRI. Um, I, I'd like to ask a question that Dr. Arlay and the and the panelists and every get everyone's opinion. When you see this, what are your considerations for anterior versus posterior surgery? Perhaps a, a, a lateral corpectomy here, um, cage placement, or or from the back. Dr. Arlay, can you take us through some of your decision making on that and what you think some of the advantages and disadvantages are? I, I, I think this patient first, he already had some lateral uh, surgery. He had already some uh, la, uh, lateral uh, cages uh, at the bottom. We don't see it too well on this. He side. did, yeah. And, uh, but he, he had some, so it's already uh, making the choice of going uh, and turning the spine a bit more difficult. It's feasible, but it's a bit more difficult. Uh, then in kyphotic deformity, I find the kyphotic deformity uh, are the ones which the, the it makes the uh, posterior approach the easier because uh, of the it, it's uh, uh, it's easier to resect a wedge out of a kyphotic deformity than uh, going anteriorly and kyphosis is very difficult. It's very deep to go and decompress the the spinal cord going anteriorly and kyphosis where we don't see much. So uh, mm -hmm. in kyphosis, my preference is often to go in the back and to do a, a decompression from the back uh, through. A, uh, PSO or three column astronomy or some uh, uh, veteran resection. But um, I don't know what's, uh, what the other people think. Yeah, thanks, Vince. I'm, I'm just happy he walked into your clinic and not mine. Um, that being said, I, I, I echo those sentiments. You know, I worry, you know, this guy has a history of infection. So obviously that's important to, to make sure that's not ongoing before we consider some big operation. But I think, especially in the, the rigid nature of this deformity, oftentimes if, if you're planning a lateral based surgery um, and you're, you're planning to go in there and do a corpectomy or potentially a two level lateral corpectomy in this case, and he still has some degree of fused segment posteriorly or within the posterior elements, you're not gonna get you know the bang for your buck. And then all of a sudden you start talking about, well, do you do posterior releases first and then go lateral and then go posterior or are you doing simultaneous surgery and I think, as, as you mentioned earlier, then, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're putting a lot of things together when, especially in this situation, I think a posterior construct, so uh, and obviously pretty difficult, uh, can get the job done. And uh, so go on the MRI for a second. So if, if this were, for example, a thoracic disc, it's not obviously, but, you know, we would say kind of doing this posteriorly, um, at least our teaching is, is, is almost contraindicated. The difference I think important to point out is when we do it posteriorly, when you correct the kyphosis also, um, it it's, uh, has a tendency to push that away. So if this were a thoracic disc and we were doing no deep thoracic decompression, uh, um, if this were a thoracic disc and we weren't doing a ventral decompression, I think at the apex of the kyphosis, it would be very possible to run into problems. But if you're fixing the kyphosis also, um, so I, I, I agree with, uh, uh, with what Dave and, and Dr. Arlay said, um, from the back is probably a little bit, a little bit easier here. Uh, feasible, I think, um, especially without the redo nature. Um, but anyway, um, I, I, I agree with the posterior assessment here, but either approach is kind of challenging because he has previous surgery from the back and the, and the front. Keep going. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll go through, uh, our operative plan, again, uh, Dr. Osterich uh, uh, touched on some of this, um, but our, our ultimate plan here was a, a T11, T12 uh, vertebral column <laughs> section with a T5 to pelvis fusion. Um, I'll, I'll talk through a couple of uh, a couple of our considerations. Dr. Uh, Arlay, Dr. Osterich, uh, certainly feel free to, to jump in to elaborate on any of these points. Um, but our thought first off uh, with a, with a rigid uh, non-union, um, again, the rigidity of, of, uh, uh, of what we were dealing with here, the only way to really get, uh, again, 30 degrees of, of kyphosis right at that level, the, the only way to really get a, a significant correction here is, was, our, our thought was to, um, you know, do, do this as a Schwab six um, uh, osteotomy to really uh, bring him back. Um, and that was, that was the reasoning there. The prior laminectomy defect, um, just a, a, a general point as far as, um, you know, how we, how we handled that. Again, this was uh, to Dr. Alay's point of, of massive uh, epidural scarring. 
um, you know, we, we approached it in, in sort of a standard fashion where we, uh, you know, define the, the edges of, of the prior laminectomy. Um, one important point here is that the, the thoracic dura uh, in comparison to the lumbosacral dura certainly uh, tends to be, um, you know, significantly more resilient. And, and you can kind of use that in your dissection and your, your definition of that epidural plane. Um, if you're able to, to uh, get under that scar with, with an uh, angled curette, you can actually pull back uh, uh, with a Lexel or, or other rongeur, um, define that plane, and then use, use an upgoing curette, angled curette, just to further um, you know, peel away that scar. Uh, and that, again, that thoracic dura is, is fairly resilient and, and can um, handle uh, 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 that sort of um, uh, definition uh, of that scar. And that, that can certainly help. Uh, when you're uh, starting out a, a big osteotomy, just to have you know very clear anatomy, um, uh, certainly in the uh, in the epidural space as well, and that's that's how we uh, how we did it here. Um, the other thing we we talked about this at length uh, already, but he's uh, we've lost you know basically with his with the degree of of you know kind of pan lumbar fusion that he already has uh, across the disc spaces, we, we've kind of lost uh, that option uh, for. Uh, for correction, uh, for accessing those disc spaces. And that really, again, adds to, to you know, uh, the consideration of posterior uh, approach for correction here. Um, his body habitus as well, this played into positioning. He, he's a very, um, uh, you know, very thin guy, very frail guy. And um, uh, it, it, it took some, uh, some real finagling with, uh, with pro, pro axis uh, Jackson table, but, um, you know, you get, really have to consider placement of your of your hip bolsters and exactly where the the, the table breaks, um, and that can be a, a bit challenging if your body habitus is not helping you out. But we we're able to get that set up for him. Uh, one additional uh, uh, finer point is uh, that th he, he had lateral cages uh, up at the level of our uh, of our VCR, um, and uh, as as we were uh, you know doing our osteotomy, um, doing our corpectomy, and getting down to to both the vertebral body and, and disc space, we're able to, because we had such a wide lateral exposure for uh, the, the purpose of VCR, we were able to, uh, to remove these lateral cages uh, while approaching everything posteriorly, something that, um, that we obviously don't do too often here. It, it was obviously it was, uh, necessitated. Um, so before I go into uh, post-operative uh, results and imaging, any additional points, um, doctors Arle and Ostrich that we'd wanna bring up here? I have. I want to bring up one point, and and Dr. Arley and 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 to the other um, panelists. Very frequently, we see patients who've had a cervical fusion down to say T1 or T2, and if you're doing thoracolumbar surgery and you want to stop in the upper thoracic spine, I've seen people very comfortable. If it's the thoracic spine, obviously stabilized by the rib cage, stopping a level or two short of the cervical construct, or is it best? to hook up. What are people's thoughts on that? Dr. Arlay, I know you tend to favor uh, connecting constructs whenever possible. Is that true? Uh, yes, yes and no. When, when it's, it goes to the cervical spine, it, obviously you don't like to see a patient who's having a, a, a C2 or down to the pelvis a fusion. So you like to you like to keep some motion between the, the two, but the, the, the issue is uh, uh, you, you see so much breakdown when you only have a, a couple of levels uh, left between the cervical spine construct and, and the thoracic spine. So mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, I don't in have the thoracic to... spine too. Does it, in your experience, it tends to break down if you leave a couple? Yeah, but it, it's like you have a thoracic lumbar stopping at T4, T5, and let's say you have a cervical construct ending at T1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 you see it. So yeah, sure. I don't have the answer for this. I, I'm yeah. still. Uh, looking for some answer for my uh, my uh -huh. colleagues who <laughs> take care of this kind of problem. Okay, so very good. All right, so th this was uh, this is what our correction uh, looked like. What we were able to get with that um, with that VCR. Um, couple a uh, couple points to note here. Uh, this again is the level uh, of our VCR. We placed a harms cage um, after we had uh, completed the, the resection of the, the vertebral bodies there, um, just for uh, this area to have uh, you know some support uh, anteriorly. Um, and we uh, added um, a satellite rod just to 
um, disperse uh, forces along the construct uh, as well. Um, but uh, he had a good correction, obviously radiographically and, um, uh, and on uh, physical exam uh, as well. Um, so I will, uh, I will leave it at that. I'll stop sharing here and just open that up, open it up for discussion. So, so, so one thing I'd just like to say that the case, the Hams case, it looks to be a bit tilted, but as a matter of fact, it, it fits perfectly the anterior aspect of the both vertebral body. If you look at the close-up view, a close-up view, it, it would be, it's, it, it's, it's nice and, and uh, perfect. So you, we don't see it. If you look carefully, you're going to see the anterior wall. It looks to be too much in the front, but it's not, as a matter of fact. I was, uh, when I saw the post-op X-ray, I said, well, what's going on? And then the close-up view uh, uh, showed that uh, it's, as a matter of fact, uh, perfectly sitting on, on the two sides of the VCR. And always and so, good, to, I think, kind of use um, some inner body cage and, you know, especially where there's cord where we're doing VCRs is probably preferable on like the lumbar spine where we don't don't always do that. But uh, Vincent, what kind of bio fire infection, do you often use plastic surgery for closure for these cases or? We like to, it's not, uh, they're not always available. Okay, so, so they may be in, a, in just a, uh, in other hospital doing some tummy touch or other things and they, they, they get, <laughs> so, so it's, uh, we, we, we like as much as possible to get plastic surgery involved, but we have uh, some cases to do our the flaps ourselves uh, when we finish late and not uh, available. So that's uh, uh, obviously, uh, that's a big plus uh, to, to, to have. Uh, we, 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 we had a plastic surgeons, uh, but he left uh, three or four months ago, so that's uh, made uh, the closure of our spine a bit more difficult. So, but it, it's it's a, it's a very good point. We should have a plastic surgeon for these cases. What biologic do you use? That's a lot of uh, territory to cover. We we, we use a BMP uh, to to the local graph on the resection, and then the BMP afterwards to 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 get the fusion air. Yeah. Okay, very good. Should we move on to the next case? Dr. Lee, uh, or Dr. Whitaker, I think is next. Whitaker, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi everybody, uh, Colin Whitaker here. I'm one of the uh, Spine Fellows Orthopedic at Penn. Um, this is uh, one of our interesting cases. So this is a 76 year old female who presented to us with uh, basically difficulty walking. She's uh, had back pain, leg pain, pain all over. She came, she came to us in a quite debilitated state. Um, significant past uh, medical history and past surgical history as well. Obviously you see diabetes, um, two cervical uh, surgeries in the past, as well as two lumbar surgeries. Uh, one was a L4-5 Lamy fusion. That was almost 20 years ago. Um, and then that was followed up with a L1-3 to laminectomy, which will be uh, pertinent to, to her care moving forward. Um, uh, she also had a, a D-cube requiring a flap, um, which just shows you how debil debilitated she was when she showed up to us. Uh, put some of the uh, important parameters down the, on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Um, before we jump to them, I uh, uh, just wanted to point out that we do obtain these full-length EOS films uh, for pretty much all of our deformity cases, uh, which really gives us a, a, a real good understanding of their, their global alignment. Um, you know, it jump, what jumps out to you is obviously she has that uh, kyphotic deformity at the TL junction, almost 60 degrees when she's standing upright. Uh, but you can really see how she's compensating with her uh, hips and knees flexed. And uh, even with that, she has a, a positive sagittal vertical axis of almost uh, 14 degrees. And her, uh, her PILL uh, mismatch is, is, is almost 40 degrees. Um, so she has quite, quite a lot of pathology going on. Um, and like I said, she has that um, uh, TL junction kyphosis. Um, and uh, the next slide you'll, you'll see... She has a, a CT scan, which re really uh, depicts what's going on. Um, some adjacent segment disease there at T12 L1, um, end plate erosive changes, uh, vacuum disc phenomenon. And she, she pretty much has a, an ankylosed 
lumbar spine as well. And on the right of your screen, we did obtain a, a CT myelogram for this patient. Um, and at, at the top, you can see in her, in her thoracic level, she has a nice patent canal. Um, but uh, below in her lumbar spine, uh, the CT Milo, you can, you know, barely make out any, any of the dye there. It, there's, it's quite adherent um, to her, her post-laminectomy bed, uh, which really uh, would end up giving us uh, a trouble during, during her surgery. Um, so we, we uh, performed our, the, the, one of the first part of our, our surgery was a T5 to pelvis posterior spinal fusion. Our initial plan was to do a, a PSO right there at the uh, kyphotic um, segment at, at L1. Um, unfortunately, um, the, the scarring from the previous laminectomy gave us, uh, some troubles and, um, had, uh, two incidental gerotomies and, uh, basically her dura was anytime we, we looked at it, it would just start leaking. So we, um, we ended up, uh, converting to just doing a, a Smith Pete osteotomy, um, there at the L1, uh, T12 L1 level. And um, we actually were able to uh, uh, leverage her, her deformity there and basically perform a, a you know, fish mouth osteotomy there and obtained a, a really nice correction. Uh, we backed this up uh, with uh, two satellite rods, so four rods across the uh, uh, deformity correction. Um, so postoperatively, she actually had a, a really nice outcome. She was uh, having uh, substantial gains in her uh, mobility. She was standing upright, um, very happy. Um, <clears throat> a couple months later, um, you know, we were concerned about the amount of uh, gapping uh, that we left her with. Um, and she was having a little bit of back pain, but doing over well, doing well overall. Um, so we, we did obtain a CT scan and it really shows the amount of anterior column void um, that remained. Um, so that's a lot of stress going through the TL junction there, especially, um, or even with our, our four rods. Um, so we, we talked to her about this and, and we ended up taking her back to the OR, um, we did a lateral approach, um, and just to support the anterior column and protect our, um, posterior construct, um, <clears throat> we did a T, a partial T12 L1 corpectomy, um, uh, harms cage, and then, um, uh, supplemented that with, uh, screws and rods uh, anteriorly at T12 and L1. Um, Postoperatively, we got a, we didn't end up, she got a CT scan uh, for other reasons, but did show that um, our harms cage was uh, very nicely placed there. Um, so these are just before and after um, x-rays. Um, and again, we, we, we like to get the EOS films, uh, really good, good idea. Um, just to point out on the, on the lateral view, she, she has a, a excellent standing posture. Um, we did uh, leave her a little undercorrected in the, in the lumbar spine. Her PILL mismatch um, was uh, still about 20 degrees or so, um, but she's pretty much um, neutral across the TL junction. And uh, most importantly, you know, her sagittal vertical axis is, is, is substantially improved. She's happy. She's standing upright with her hips and her um, knees in, in extension. Um, and uh, overall, a happy patient. Colin, um, this is an excellent case, kind of similar to the first one we presented, but at the same time, very different. I think it highlights uh, the importance of keeping your plans fluid in deformity surgery. Um, you know, this is an excellent case of just adjusting and you had a plan of going in with a, to do a pedicle subtraction osteotomy that wasn't feasible um, because of the, the nature of the dura. So instead of a posterior column shortening, you did an anterior column lengthening and, and ended up with a very good result. Dr. Arley, you've published on this before. What are some, what are some small tidbits you can give us in terms of uh, trying to do three column work when there's a very significant uh, epidural scarring? Uh, yeah, so so I, I think it's uh, the first thing when there's a massive epidural scarring, just uh, I, I think, can you do a, a surgery without having to go in this uh, massive epidural scar? So that's why uh, if you have a disc that's free in the front, uh, I just uh, I think it's better to go in the front and get some correction uh, without having to deal with this uh, massive epidural scarring. So the first, uh, whether you go anteriorly or oblique. And then in a case like this, unfortunately, you have no choice but to go posteriorly because you have to uh, do a long fixation, you have to decompress or whatever you have to do, and you have to 
to peel the scar from the dura, which is some, sometimes it's easy. And you just say, wow, I'm so good. I peeled the, the scar and the dura two minutes and I got correct and everything just uh, mm -hmm. uh, dissected nice. And, and other times you just look at the dura, you go, you do something and it starts to leak. And yeah. you say, okay, you repair it, you wait, you go another place. And then it, it, it starts to leak back again. So, and that's what the case, as a matter of fact, it is it's tied to, to, to anything we were doing. So eventually uh, I, I got one of your, uh, partner was to come and uh, fix the dura and I thought I'm not going to try to do a PSO so I do what's called the, the fish mouth the technique so when you put the rod and you inside bend with the inside you bend so you open up more than a, a typical SPO uh, you can do that with a PSO and then break the anterior cortex as well to get more correction with that take you inside to benders at the end and you just go yeah. and, mm -hmm. and, and get more and more correction uh, uh, I thought it, it worked out uh, uh, pretty well in this case, and uh, and obviously we, we put it for rods because uh, we thought that with this big gap, uh, she would eventually need to have uh, anterior support, and and uh, we waited for her to be uh, to be well a couple of months later to do a, to a minimal invasive uh, approach on the side and to, to put the arm cage. It's always an issue. This uh, massive epidural scarring makes our night miserable. <laughs> Indeed, let's um, let's be mindful of the time. We have one more case, uh, Dr. Lee. All right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Chun Lee. I uh, completed a neurosurgery residency last year, and I'm currently doing a complex spinal deformity um, surgery fellowship at uh, in the orthopedics department. So my case uh, is, a, is of a 60 year old female who presented with low back pain radiating, radiating into bilateral legs. She obviously in the past had multiple surgeries, uh, including L4-5, L5-S1 A-lifts with, a spinal, process, with uh, spinal process clamps in the back and l 3 lifts as well. Uh, she describes the pain as 90% back pain and 10% uh, leg pain. The pain radiates into the thighs with standing and walking and it's worse on the right side compared to the left. She does uh, ambulate with a rolling walker, which, Im which improves her back pain. And of note, she also has a intrathecal morphine pump that, with the catheter that enters at T12 L1. She um, underwent an L23 ESI, which improved her pain significantly um, in the meantime of uh, during the workup and during the uh, conservative treatment phase of the, of the of the process. Um, yeah, past medical history and surgical history include anxiety, depression, IBS, OSA, hysterectomy. Social history, she's a non-smoker. She occasionally drinks alcohol. So on exam, she was basically uh, intact. She is five feet, four inches, and she weighs 173 pounds with a BMI of uh, almost 30. So here is a lateral and AP view of the of her uh, lumbar spine, you can sort of see the morphine pump here in this series here. Uh, and here's an upright AP and lateral X-ray. I wanted to include this um, CT scan because you can see here the, the actual catheter for the morphine pump enters on the left side. And you can see the 3-4 uh, T-left cage was at, on more towards the left than right. There's an MRI. You can see that she has enterolisthesis at 3-4 and also spinal stenosis at 2-3, which probably explains why she responded so well to the uh, L2-3 ESI. So the surgery that we did was an L2-3 OLIF with a 10 degree cage and L2-3 OLIF with a hyperlordotic cage and uh, removed the prior T left cage and uh, flipped her and did a T10 to pelvis plus her spinal fusion with the accessory rod on the right side and double pelvic fixation. Um, we also were able to preserve the morphine pump catheter as well. So this is her post op films. You can see here the accessory rod on the right side. So on her three month follow up, um, She's about five months out now. I was actually hoping that she would uh, have her six months follow up by today, but unfortunately she has not. 
Um, during her three month follow up, she um, her pre op symptoms were all improved. She's still ambulating with a walker when outside of her home, but she's able to walk without it inside her home. Um, she is also weaning her morphine pump, so her dosages have been decreasing pretty steadily. So this is her full um, EOS film. Here you can see um, preoperatively, she had uh, a PI of about 40 degrees with a uh, lumbar lordosis of about 25 degrees and post-op she has about, uh, she, so we were able to increase the lumbar lordosis to about 34 degrees, 33 degrees here. And in terms of her, um, in terms of our uh, SVA pre-op, she was about 10 centimeters uh, positive and, and post-op she was about four, just under four centimeters positive here. And this is her uh, AP view. And that's the end of my case. Uh, thanks, that's a, a great case and, and shows the power of you being using the, the disk spaces, the unfused segments that are available to us instead of necessarily uh, doing a, a more uh, complicated and, and more morbid uh, PSO or, or three column work. Dr. Arley, how do you, um, when we do an A-lift, obviously we, just by virtue of doing the annulotomy, we're going through the ALL and, and we're, we're releasing that, that band. Um, I assume you cut the ALL in these cases. And what are your tips? I always struggle distracting from a lateral approach a lot more than an anterior. Um, any tips for the, the group uh, on, on these two? I mean, yeah, I mean, if I may, may just uh, say something, I, I think the key is to, uh, when you go laterally to, to, uh, to get the, some corrections to reject the uh, ALL. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I think for this case, uh, uh, early leaf approach, anti psoas approach is probably better than the X-Lift, which I find a bit difficult with the X-Lift to resect the LL. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with an early leaf, you, you push the psoas posteriorly and you can go uh, all the way across on the opposite side and you see the LL, you can resect it with a knife or a small uh, pituitary rangeur and you just uh, take bites of it. And once it's totally resected, you can just uh, template your discus space uh, more and more with the increasing height of uh, the cages until you, you have the desired cages uh, you, you want to put in like a 20 or even sometimes 30 degree cage from the lateral approach. But the key is to resect the LL. So otherwise you plow into the end plate. Uh, and that's, uh, I see, so. Vince, what do you think was the mistake on the second operation? The fact that they didn't get full length films, that they didn't pay any attention to the overall alignment. Uh, can we go back to that slide? Um, uh, Colin, I think that was your, your case. We're talking Sorry. about my case or Colin's case? Colin's case, I believe. No, I, I, I'd say I am. You're talking about this case? No, uh, no, no. The, the one we just looked at. Where oh, they did the this is a, a Sean, Sean, it's your case. Sir. So it's a, Sean, it's your case with the, the uh, X top in the back. The patient who had the uh, interspinous uh, spacer in the back. I don't know whether it's X top or the, another brand. Okay, sir. Yeah, so here they did the T lift, and you can see she was way out of alignment. So, you know, it seems like a simple operation. She had two level fusion before, then they do this second operation and uh, that sort of led to what you end up having to do and you did a beautiful job, but how could that have been prevented originally, do you think? You know, to keep her I from think, having this major reconstruction. I think the more uh, EOS machine we'll have available in the countries, the better a job all the surgeons will do because they will get to realize that we they haven't built in enough low doses so we need to build in more low doses in the lumbar spine so i, I think probably to as uh, a quality improvement across the country <laughs> to get the old i mean me it made me a better surgeon there's no question about this uh, when i decided to look carefully at the os uh, at the eos uh, films uh, what was related to the knee, to the to the hip, to the hip extension, uh, or the the lack of lumbar lordosis, you understand much better what's going on. 
it's uh, instead of a small number of film uh, that's often don't tell you the whole truth. It's just disappointing to see iatrogenic flatback, you know, in, in current generation, particularly when it's progressive. You know, it's, it's not like somebody made a mistake in one operation. It's somebody who should have appreciated what was there when he was operating the next segment and tried to correct it. So, you know, it, and technically, you know, they, they knew how to operate around the spine, but um, the fact that they, they still didn't appreciate the sagittal alignment is uh, just, again, a little disappointing about 30 behind the times. Yeah, I agree with you, Jack. But, but the key thing is, if you only look sometimes at lumbar spine, you say, oh, the lordosis it looks good. And, but it's only when you see the whole staying spine from head to toes that you say, well, it was not enough for these patients. So the, the alignment is not good. The patient is still flexing his knees to keep his balance. It's, uh, and you, you see so much more on the EOS film uh, that it's... Uh, uh, I think, you know, Vince, I, th I think your point's well taken, you know, and they've always said that, you know, any fusion case or any lumbar case really is a deformity case. And if they had gotten an EOS originally, then maybe they would have said, OK, well, we need to add more lordosis and whatever. Uh, but this happens a lot. There's a lot of people that just operate in the lumbar spine and they don't pay any attention to the overall alignment. I mean, fortunately, because the people like you and, and our partners that do a lot of deformity, you know, Jack and I are acutely aware of this. Yeah, I, I was surprised tonight that not to see Easy uh, just uh, again, arguing with all our cases. Okay, he's, uh, he's on vacation. What's going on? <laughs> he may be in the OR. I'm not certain. Okay, so oh, no, no, no problem. All right. Um, well, that was an excellent um discussion. Thank you for sharing the cases and for your talk. Um, we still have a few minutes for uh, open discussion if anyone has any input. So, Vince, so how, Vince, how do you decide whether or not you're going to take out the posterior instrumentation first in a pseudoarthrosis like this? You know, how do you decide I need to remove the, the screws posteriorly, then take out the T-lift and put in, you know, my anterior inner body versus just taking out the T-lift and, and overpowering the posterior fixation. You, you, you're talking about the five, uh, 540 sequence. So you go in the back and just remove the instrumentation. You go in the front, uh, put the cage, and then go back. Uh, I, I think it's a very good question. So basically, I, I, I just never do a 540 anymore because uh, the, we, the tools we have, uh, you know, the large pattern distractor we put in the front, we can... It, it, any psoarthrosis can be overpowered from the front if you get a good technique and if you distract progressively. Uh, now, when you have a solid posterior fusion, you have to be careful because you can still overpower, but it depends what you have, uh, the quality of your bone, uh, the thickness of the posterior fusion, the, uh, the, the, the strength of the bone. But any psoarthrosis, you can go in the front first and you can move it the way you want with the proper distractor. So in the, in the face of arthrosis, if you have a, a posterior instrumentation, I, was, I would go in the front without any, uh, I don't think it, you need to remove the posterior instrumentation first. So for me, the 540 sequence is, uh, it has become obsolete as a matter of fact. You know, it's interesting that you say that, that you say that, Vince, and I was happy to see that you were doing that because I had reviewed an article for the European Spine Journal about eight or nine months ago, and they had a whole series where they did exactly that. They didn't do the 540. So I tried it on a, about two cases now, and you're exactly right. You can overpower the front. You have to be careful. I, I worry about the pedicle screws cutting out, but uh, both work fine instead of doing the 540 going back and forth and, uh, and having to come back again to the post here. I think that the more familiar you are with the front surgery, I'm talking to you guys who do lots of disc replacement. It's, and you're using this large pattern distractor. You can, if you do a very good release in the front, if you use uh, the large pattern distractor, if you uh, break the table at the time you want to give more low doses for four, five, and five, one, you, 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 it's amazing what you can overpower from the front. And especially if you have some arthrosis in the back uh, and uh, Obviously, you, you always worry about the screw. Sometimes you have a, a screw that doesn't seem to be perfect, but it's, it's not a problem. You're not going to go in the back anyway and remove it and, and do a Smith Peter in the back to get more correction or check your nerve. So I think a 540 is a shoe, it has lost uh, 
is, is a traction. Uh, now we can just overpower the, uh, the, the, the spine from the front. Thank you, gentlemen. Penn, you did a great job. Um, Vince, it's always a pleasure. And